Hello, listeners. Welcome to Misfit Apparitions, the podcast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Don, and in this episode, we continue our series on the Velisca Axe Murder House with a three-part phone interview with the person most knowledgeable about the Velisca Axe Murder case, Dr. Edgar Epperly, author of the book Fiend Incarnate, Velisca Axe Murders of 1912. This episode contains mature subject matter. Listener discretion is advised. He is the author of the book Fiend Incarnate, Velisca Axe Murders of 1912, and is highly regarded as being the leading authority on the case. Misfit Apparitions is honored to welcome to the podcast Dr. Edgar Epperly. Dr. Epperly, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. Oh, I'm excited about it. Glad to do it. So that our listeners have a better understanding of your 60-plus years of dedication to this case, could you provide background on how it all got started? Uh, I grew up about 100 miles from Villisca, and I and two friends went to college at uh, what was Iowa State Teachers College then. We were going to be history teachers in high school, and uh, in our senior year, we had a, a took a course in Iowa history, and there was a, a kind of a culmination paper at the end, a, a, a substantial paper, and uh, we got talking. I remember clearly on a Sunday afternoon, we were riding down the road talking and said, well, what if we would propose to do original research rather than just library research and see if we could persuade the teacher to let us do a joint paper? And uh, we did. We proposed that and she okayed it. And our choice of topic was just, uh, again, by chance, uh, we had all heard of the Villisca murder, but uh, none of us knew anything about it. And so we proposed to do a paper on the Villisca murder. And so the first time I went to Villisca was in uh, the spring of 1956. I've, I've been giving speeches around Iowa at libraries since the book came out. And uh, I've been telling people it was 1955. But when I go back and, and look at the record, I find it was a year later than that. So uh, the three of us went there. We spent an extended weekend there, interviewed as many people as we could locate that it would cooperate and agree to the interview. I read the local newspapers and did some photographs of the house and the cemetery and those kinds of things. And out of that, we uh, produced a... Uh, paper for this course. Uh, one of the guys, uh, Don Brown and I, we, we both stayed in Iowa, taught a while, and uh, uh, for a decade or more, we uh, continued to research the case, the two of us. Uh, Leo Mundy, the third fellow, he went off to uh, graduate school and ended up a uh, PhD in um, educational statistics and uh, so on. Uh, the other two guys are, are dead now, uh, but uh, that's how I got started in it. Didn't know anything about it. <laughs> we didn't know enough really to interview people very well. We, we met some very key interviews and got some interesting information, but had we known more about the case, we would have been able to guide those interviews a little more uh, uh, appropriately, I think. Very interesting. So let me ask, follow up a question. What compelled you to continue researching the case beyond that paper? <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, some of my friends say an obsession. Um, it, it really became, uh, uh, it gradually grew. You know, I was all excited about being a teacher. I, I enjoyed high school teaching. I 
taught for 10 years and I got married. I, um, we went back to graduate school, my wife and I, and uh, I ended up in the education department working with people who were going to be teachers. And uh, at Luther College, which is in extreme northeast Iowa, where I live now, uh, I retired 20 years ago. But during all of those years, uh, I had a file cabinet and I would occasionally run across something that I thought was interesting and I would read it and note it. And then I started to get a little more systematic. And uh, I think it was triggered partly by the fact that we got uh, possession of the murder weapon. Right. We, uh, I was reading a 1945 article in the Des Moines paper and it had a picture of a guy named Risden, James Risden, and he was standing there holding the axe. And the caption of the paper said that Risden, who was the head of the Iowa Bureau of Criminal Investigation, which was formed in partly in response to the murder, by the way, but he um, he was going to write a book about the murder, and the axe was in his possession. Well, I was teaching, and Don was uh, living in Des Moines, and so I gave him a call, and I said, you know, I ran across this picture. Uh, I'll bet you that uh, Risden is either dead or still in Des Moines, and so he called. Uh, he, he did find the number in the directory, and uh, he called and got a um, elderly woman. Yes, he, he was my husband. He's dead. Uh, yes, I, we have the axe. It's upstairs in the closet. Would you sell it? Oh, I'd give it away. It gives me the willies. And so Don went down and uh, talked to her, and she gave him the axe. And uh, then about a week later, he began to get, he realized he needed to have a little more information. And so he took a notary republic with him. And uh, she and he went down, and uh, they. Um, she wrote a notarized statement, uh, the lady, Mrs. Risden, that this was the axe, and uh, signed it. And Don had offered her money, and she, she wouldn't take money. So he gave her a box of chocolate-covered cherries, <laughs> wow. which were popular confectionaries in those days. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we got the axe. Uh, there is, there's little doubt that it is the axe. Uh, the people who own the house and have it open for display, they display uh, axe, uh, and uh, they um, they would like, in the worst way, to to get the uh, original axe. Of course, I understand that. I mean, I would I would too if I were, you know, had a museum that I was displaying and getting people to come to and so on. We were reluctant to, uh, we, we never felt, or I never felt that we um, owned the axe. We, we possessed the axe, and it should be in a museum. And so we, uh, Don left, went to uh, Indiana, and I um, got the axe and had it in my possession for 25 years, I suppose. And then when the uh, Rundles wrote, uh, did the movie on the murder of Villisca, Living with a Mystery, uh, I was a consultant on that project, and we got to be friends. And they, by the way, were instrumental in the book that I've gotten out now, The uh, Fiend Incarnate. They um, took the axe, and when they showed their film around Midwest, particularly Iowa, uh, they took the axe with them, and it was part of the display. After that, uh, I gave the axe to the Villisca Historical Society, which is, like a lot of historical societies, a few older people, not much money, no building. Uh, they didn't really have any way of, of protecting the axe or displaying it. And so they put it on loan at the Iowa State Historical Society in Des Moines, which is where it is now. It is the legal possession of the Villisca Historical Society, but it's on an extended loan to the state. If you look at the history of it, the axe itself, uh, there are photographs that were taken at the time of the murder 
the axe is an old and battered one, and it's got some marks and scars and things, and you can match those to this axe to show that it's obviously the same axe. There also are exhibits, information written on the axe in India ink. It's getting a little dim over the years, but it's there. You can read it. Uh, it was displayed at the Kelly trial in 1917, who's the only person who was tried for the murder. And uh, there is not only the exhibit number on it, there is also the initials, uh, three-letter initials of the fellow who was the court reporter for the judge at that trial. And he's a, the court reporter is in charge of the exhibits. And so he identified it by doing that. Oh, the uh, axe itself was uh, the night of the murder, the night the murder was discovered, Monday, the uh, 10th of June, 1912. Uh, the county sheriff, Oren Jackson, came home to the jail in Red Oak, which is the county seat of Montgomery County. And a guy named Tom Motes was dating his daughter. And he was there and he said, he came in, he had this thing wrapped up in a uh, gunny sack and his wife asked him, what is that? And he said, well, that's the, the ax that killed those people over in Villisca. And he put it in the front closet. And then it was in the possession of the county throughout from 1912 until the 1920s. The last trial, which uh, was, I believe, in 1921, the last litigation growing out of the murder, and sometime between then and 1932, dates not certain, the sheriff of Montgomery County gave the ax to Risden. And that's perfectly legal. The uh, The case was closed, and uh, there was no reasonable thought. They have to offer the exhibits to relatives. Not surprisingly, the relatives didn't want it, and so he was free to do with it as he pleased. And he knew Risden, who had been an investigator at the, uh, the Kelly trial, and uh, they were friends, and so he knew Risden was interested, and so he gave him the ax. Risden had it until 1964. Okay. That's when uh, we got it, Don Brown got it from the, his wife. And Don had it in a little bookstore in Leon, Iowa, where we grew up. And after he left the state, I had it in my upstairs closet. Uh, we've, I've had, when I tell this story, I've had a lot of people ask me, well, is there any blood on it? I mean, could you get blood or anything like that off of it? And I said, well, I, I doubt it. It certainly has been handled a lot by many people. It'd be very difficult to distinguish who, what you were getting. And I said, in my case, I don't think it'd be blood. I think it'd be gravy stains because <laughs> people knew by this time that I was uh, involved with this murder and had been most of my life. And so we would have people over for dinner, that kind of thing, and be sitting around the table. And someone was sure to say, do you really have a, the ax that they did that murder? And I said, yeah, it's upstairs. You want to see it? <laughs> <laughs> so I would hop upstairs bring it down and of course everybody wanted to handle it and then it would go around the dinner table yeah. <laughs> and uh i said there's a better chance it'd have gravy stains on it than it would have blood but absolutely uh, anyway there there's been a pretty close uh analysis of where the axe was i don't think there's any doubt at all that it is the murder weapon correct there are only really two artifacts that uh, survive the axe is obvious. We've already talked to that. The other one is the house. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of talk. What are we going to do with the house? Uh, let's, should we burn it down? Should we tear it down? But uh, it was a relatively valuable house. It wasn't a big house, but it was worth uh, some real money in those days and uh, too valuable to just uh, uh, tear down. Uh, and so they uh, uh, refurbished it and had a difficult time renting it, but they finally got it in the market. And from, I think it was 1915 until the 1990s, uh, it was 
uh, in private hands. It was either owned or rented during those years. And over the years, there have been several families that have lived there. And then the um, uh, Lynn's, Darwin Lynn and his wife Marfa, they bought the house. The Lynn's had a museum up on the square at, uh, in Villisca, and they saw this as a way of expanding the museum. And they uh, uh, did, a, a, I thought, a nice job of returning it to 1912. Uh, they tore out the plumbing. They tore out the electricity. They opened the porch up again and, and had the porch there, all of those things. They furnished it with period furniture. It is not the furniture that was in the house. Right. That was all distributed to the relatives in the month after the murder. Uh, they they divvied up the chairs and tables and so on. To my knowledge, I would doubt that there's uh, individual pieces somewhere that survived, but uh, they didn't make any conscious effort to save any of the things. Right. They also, um, all of the bedding, and uh, well, that's quite a story, actually. Uh, the um, county uh, attorney directed the county sheriff to clean the house after the murder. And he went to the Villisca Day Marshal, uh, Hank Horton, and said, Hank, you know, the county's going to pay for this, and you you get somebody to get rid of the uh, soiled bedding and clean the house and so on. And so he hired a guy named Fescuni, uh, Fescuni Sylvester Cooney, who in turn hired a, a kid named, a younger man named uh, Carl Peterson. And the two of them went down on Thursday of the murder week. Murder was discovered, done Sunday night, discovered Monday morning, and on Thursday. The funeral was on Wednesday, and so this was after the funeral. They went in, and uh, they uh, took the bedding and the uh, uh, any bloody clothes that were there, all of that, wrapped it up in the mattress, put a wire around it to hold it together, and then they had a drayman, uh, Kettle Overman. I don't know what his real name was, but his nickname was Kettle. I, I don't know if that means he was uh, portly and heavy or uh, who knows. But anyway, he they filled his wagon with these bedding. Carl Peterson didn't have... Uh, he didn't have quite the stomach for the job. After they got the Stillinger girls' room uh, cleaned, he refused to go upstairs. He said, "Let's go upstairs." And uh, he said, "I'm not going. I, I can't. I can't do it. I'm sick." So he went out in the yard, and then that uh, Sylvester went on up fast, and he the stairway is very narrow and curved. And he couldn't get uh, the uh, mattresses down the stairway. So they took out the front windows in the south and pushed them out that way, out the windows. Uh, when one of them slid down, it stained. The blood on the, the uh, mattress and bedding stained the house a little bit. And so Carl had recovered enough that he had got, he went and got a, pail of whitewash and uh, painted out the uh, blood stains on the wall on the side of the house. Uh, I've often thought, I, I think this would make a marvelous movie, this story, but uh, uh, I can't convince anybody in Hollywood of that, but that's what I think. And um, I've always seen it. I do a little artistic license and have them cleaning the house when the funeral was going on and cut back and forth between the funeral oration and the music and the soil bedding going out the window and the upstairs, things like that. I mm -hmm. think that'd make a interesting scene. That sounds really interesting. So, As um, you can see, go ahead. I don't need much of a stimulation. 
Well, um, if you don't mind, um, so as one would expect in any American small town, a shocking murder such as this without a suspect in custody, much less any leads to one, fear and anxiety grip Velisca. So starting with June 9th, 1912, can you tell us how this case unfolded? Well, the, it, it always seemed to me that one of the, the problems was that there, there had been nothing in the lives of any of the people involved in this, close relatives and just townspeople, that uh, gave any uh, preparation, uh, any precedent for it. You know, the Iowa, you always have murders. You, you have a, a, a bar fight and someone gets killed. You'll have a love triangle and someone gets shot. And you'll have a, a, a family of, of imbroglio in which someone gets brained with a skillet and uh, they're always those kinds of things are uh, within our understanding but the Velisca murder is is not within our understanding uh, certainly not in 1912 uh, it is comparable to Jack the Ripper um, those kinds of murders that are motivated by some kind of uh, force within the individual the murderer is driven by forces that most of us we may have them but they're not nearly as strong nor are they at the surface of our lives and so nobody they they, they could it was inexplicable to them they they couldn't uh, make sense of it it was it was just beyond the pale it was too violent it was too pointless these little children, that six of these people were 12 and under. Right. Uh, they got to two adults, and the other victims were all children. And that didn't make sense to people. Why would you kill the children? Why, why would you do that? And so when the word spread, and it spread very rapidly, but when it spread, uh, people streamed down to the house. Uh, they, you get all kinds of estimates, but certainly... Several hundred people gathered around the house, and uh, many of them went through the house. Uh, they, uh, Hank Horton, the town marshal, uh, as soon as he had gone through the house and he had escorted a couple of doctors through the house, then he went up town and met with some of the town fathers to uh, call for help. I mean, uh, they sent out phone calls and telegrams to uh, get people uh, they asked for detectives from Omaha they 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 called the state uh, attorney general uh, those kinds of, of requests and they they ordered bloodhounds there was a, a doctor dr. Fulton in uh, Beatrice Nebraska uh, which is eastern Nebraska across the Missouri River and uh, he had a, a kennel of bloodhounds, and they, they uh, rented those, and he sent a um, handler, a man named Nofsinger, to uh, come. He didn't get there until almost 9 o'clock at night. It took, you know, you had to make the arrangements, and you had to load them on a train and take them some, up to Omaha, and then you had to wait until you got the train to bring them over, not that kind of thing. Uh, but... He left when when Hank Horton left the scene. He left a man named Harry Overman, uh, who was much younger, 26, I think. And and Harry was a night marshal. They only had two policemen in Bliska at that time. And as the night marshal and that young, he really couldn't control the crowd. They people started inching into the house, get up on the porch and look in and. Pretty soon they go. They went in the house, and when the county coroner got there about 9:30, maybe a little later, uh, he was in examining the bodies, and he said it was a madhouse. People were running from room to room and shouting. He said, "I said to Overman, why in the hell don't you get these people out of here?" And he said, "I can't do it. I push them out the front, and they come in the back." <laughs> and that was true until about. 10, 10, 30, 11, and then a, uh, the marshal from Page County, that's the, the county south 
of Villisca, uh, Montgomery County. Uh, Clarenda is the largest, is the county seat there. Uh, I can't, right now, I can't, Whitmore was his name. He arrived, and he was a mature guy who had been a sheriff for quite some time, and he immediately saw that things were out of control, and so he he deputized uh, half a dozen or a dozen guys, and they went, they got wire, and they ran a wire around the house so nobody could get in. But for the first two hours, there were, well, some people have said several, some say uh, dozens, some say more than a hundred. I don't know, quite a few people went through, nothing like we, but you must remember that there wasn't a, a roll of crime scene tape in the world in 1912, uh, certainly not in rural Iowa. Uh, and the idea of sealing the, the crime scene was all in the future. And some people have said, well, would they, would they have solved it if they hadn't had all of these people in there? And I don't think so. I don't think they, they, those people did as much damage as you might think they would uh, because they didn't collect any physical evidence in what we think of as physical evidence. They, they didn't collect any uh, body fluids or... Uh, Fingerprints. They tried to get fingerprints, but that was uh, next day before that happened. Uh, they they didn't get any, but they tried to, and they uh, but they didn't collect any uh, uh, hair or fiber, or nothing like that. Blood typing was still in the future. You know, you didn't know that blood was of a different uh, type from different people, and uh, consequently, the, what they looked for were footprints. If if they could find soft soil, could they find a footprint or something that the killer might have left uh, or someone who had seen the somebody approaching the house or leaving the house, things like that. Uh, very gross measures we're so used to and all of us are corrupted by the TV shows in which a, if a person walks through the room, you can identify all him and all his relatives in the world. Uh, with the modern techniques, but nothing, none of that existed. Mm -hmm. And so um, the uh, people were at a loss of what to do. Uh, they um, that, that led to a lot of the problems that grew out of the murder. Uh, the first assumption was that uh, the assumption by the police and the authorities was that it was a serial murder and it was related to the murders that had happened in Colorado, Illinois, and Kansas the uh, year before. And that still is a very viable theory. It's a very popular theory right now. And it may well be true. It may well be that it looks like a serial murder. It, it looks uh, like the person was motivated by interior needs that don't change and kills one after another but um, it uh, they weren't able to link anybody to it nor did they find another murder after it uh, there are some candidates but none that, that really looked like they were part of any kind of series it apparently ended with the Villisca murder the second thing they did, they uh, started to look at local people who might be uh, potential murderers. They, they, they were desperate to find the killer, and when they didn't find them, they ran out posses and they checked the trains and all of that kind of thing, but when they didn't find anyone, then they started, well, could it be one of us? Mm -hmm. And there were people within 15 minutes of the murder who were speculating that F.F. F. Jones, a local banker, hardware dealer, implement dealer, state senator, had been state representative, was uh, a leader in the Methodist Church locally, uh, kind of a pillar of the town, that maybe he had something to do with it. And that was based on the fact that, one, he wasn't a very likable guy. Most people didn't like him. There was some resentment of him. He was arrogant. 
I I interviewed a fellow and asked him, uh, how would you characterize Jones? And he said, F.F. Uh, F. Jones was an arrogant son of a bitch. You bet he was. <laughs> and uh, as he also was a direct business competitor with the murdered man, Joe Moore, had a hardware dealership and they um, sold farm implements. And in fact, he had been a salesman for F.F. F. Jones's hardware implement store. And he left and opened a competing store just across the street. So they, they had that. But the primary reason that F.F. F. Jones was suspected was his daughter-in-law, Dona Jones, had, had uh, come to town in, uh, I don't know, a little... They got married. She and, and his son got married in 10, in January of 1910, two years before the murder, two and a half years. And by the time of the murder, in 1911, she was entertaining and receiving calls from at least three different men in town asking if they could come over, and she would say, no, he's here, or yes, come on, and uh, that kind of thing. And so what they did in those trysts, uh, nobody knew, but everyone was suspicious. And that seemed like maybe uh, to save the family honor, F.F. Uh, F. Jones might have hired that murder. He, nobody thought he did it himself. He was a man of, I don't know, 59, maybe at that time. I can't remember exact age. But uh, in his late 50s, and austere, uh, more of a uh, uh, political leader, uh, he wouldn't stoop to do anything like that. But he had hire someone to do it. That's what they felt. You have been listening to Dr. Edgar Epperly, author of the book Fiend Incarnate, Villisca Axe Murders of 1912. Please join us next time on the podcast as he continues talking about one of America's coldest case files. On behalf of Misfit Apparitions, I'm Don. Thank you for listening.